everybody. Um, so the whole talk's gonna be on the whiteboard. I'm gonna say things too. If you can't see or hear something, yell at me. Uh, I probably won't be paying attention to you. Um, so yeah. What? So, the, what? <laughs> so yeah, so I implemented it. Uh, it's not great. I don't recommend anyone read it, but I'll put the link on here and I'll write it in a different color because it's a link. <laughs> Has it been visited yet? Okay. Smaller. <laughs> Does that say bit bucket? Yep. <laughs> that's my name, that's RMQ. You'll know what RMQ is soon. Um, yeah, so I work at Tokyo Tech. Uh, we build awesome databases. Um, if you want to come work for us, come talk to me later. We're hiring a bunch of stuff like sales, marketing, QA, tech support, engineers, uh, product managing. Um, come talk to me. We need to hire people. Um, I'm an engineer there. Uh, two of the founders, there were four founders, but two of them uh, wrote this paper. One of them was my professor. I'm going to basically give the lecture that he gave um, in one of the classes that I took from him, uh, which is about the LCA problem. So what is the LCA problem? stands for uh, Lowest Common Ancestor. Um, so we're going to be talking about trees. Um, so let's draw a tree. OK, there's a tree. Uh, the Lowest Common Ancestor problem is to pre-process a tree so that you can answer queries of the form Find me the lowest common ancestor for nodes u and v. Let's call this u, let's call this v. The lowest common ancestor for those two nodes is this one. So the problem we want to solve is pre-processing a tree in a certain amount of time. Call that f. So that we can answer queries of this form using that pre-processed data structure. in you know, a G amount of time. Um, and I'll use this notation. I'm going to use big O notation. If you're not comfortable with that, raise your hand now, and I will do like 30 seconds on big O. 30 seconds on big O would be great. OK. Uh, big O notation is how we analyze algorithms. Um, when you want to talk about how fast something runs, you talk about big O notation. Uh, the formalism comes from calculus. But basically, what you need to know is if you have an input of size n, then the running time is going to be some function of n. So if you have an input that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 nodes, your running time is going to be a function of the number 8. And we talk about big O of n to basically get rid of a bunch of complexity from describing this. So we talk about things that are order n, or linear time algorithms, which means you're going to process everything roughly once. Maybe you process everything twice, but you're not going to process everything a number of times equal to the size of the problem. We talk about things that are constant time, things that take one, two, three, four operations, but it doesn't depend on the size of the problem. We talk about things that are log n, which means you're usually doing some kind of binary search. We talk about things that are quadratic or n square, um, which means you know maybe for every node, we need to look at every other node. So we're going to do n things for this node, n things for this node, n things for this node, and so on. So we have n times n, and that's n squared. Um, if you have any more problems with the other big O things that I write down later, shout out again, and uh, we'll go over it. So, so it's just, excuse me, so at the, the top there, the fn, g of n, the n is the number of nodes in the tree? Yes. Okay. So n, n here is the input size. Um, the number of nodes in the tree is n. Uh, I'm going to talk about pre-processing in f of n time and answering queries in g of n time. Uh, and so you can imagine, you know, if you do no pre-processing, this is, is order one, this is constant time. And then this will be, you know, if you just given the tree at, at, up front every time, how fast can you answer the query? Um, so why do we care about lowest common ancestor? Uh, Anyone want to venture a guess? Cool. 
development, <laughs> version control, uh, GIS, compression, network routing. Um, lots of reasons you might want to know what the lowest common ancestor of two nodes is. Uh, just real quick, like for compilers, if each node is a basic block, um, maybe you have some, some variable that's used here and it's used here. You want to see like how far up in the, tr in the tree of basic blocks do I have to lift this in order to you know, make it constant and you know, yada yada. So that's cool. Um, this is a very old problem. It was first posed in 1973. Uh, it was solved optimally in 1984. Um, and then this paper was written in 2000. This actual algorithm uh, was written in 93, but it was really complicated. Uh, the 2000 paper is really cool, it's really easy to read. Hopefully most of you didn't read it because it's more fun if you don't know what's coming. Um, <laughs> but the paper in 2000 uh, was written by my professor and his friend who founded our company. Uh, they won some fancy award for it. Uh, it's been cited like a ton of times, um, and it's really cool. So I'm going to talk about it. Um, are there any assumptions made about the maximum number of children or the extent to which the tree is balanced? Nope. No it's problem. just a tree. It's, just it's purely problem. a tree in the graph theory sense. Right. So there's no cycles, um, and you have to identify a root, but there's no other restrictions. You know, this could go on down here as much as you want. There's no balancing anything. A node can only have one pair. What's that? A node can only have one pair. Yes. Uh, yeah, so no cycles restricts that. Well, no, that's the thing. So that was actually part of my question. Which okay. Is, um, the LCA is defined across a DAG classically, so is this algorithm only applicable to a tree, or is it uh, So what I'm going to describe only works for a tree. You can extend it to a DAG. Uh, the authors did in a later paper that I'm not going to talk about. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so formally the LCA problem is pick two nodes, find the, um, the node farthest from the root that is a parent of both nodes. And so we're going to pre-process a tree to do that. So uh, let's stop talking about LCA and let's talk about a different problem. God, this thing is rocky. All right, okay, that's there now. <laughs> so let's talk about RMQ. Um, RMQ stands for range minimum query. So this is a problem where you're given an array, and I conveniently wrote out an example, and I'm gonna write here. So we have an array, it's got integer elements. Now uh, the range minimum query problem is to again pre-process pre this array so that you can answer questions of the form given two indexes i and j, find me the element in between them that is the smallest. So, in a range, we're going to find the minimum element for the query, um, range minimum query. And we write this, well, don't worry about that. They put a subscript on it, but we don't need to write that. Anyway, uh, this is a different problem. You can pre-process an array in time f of n, where n is the number of elements in the array. And you can answer a query in time g of n. That should be familiar. So, um, why am I talking about this? This is about the LCA problem. It turns out we can take an LCA problem and turn it into a range minimum query problem. This is a really cool technique called reduction. If you haven't seen this before, good, because it's awesome and you should learn about it. So, how do we do this? Um, the way we're gonna do this is by constructing what's called an Euler tor, which is kind of like a depth first search. So given a tree, oh no, no, let's start it, okay, cool. I think I had the same tree before. So this is your tree. I'm going to label these nodes just so we can talk about them. I 
Actually, let me relabel those. <laughs> It'll be more interesting if I relabel them. This is going to be C. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to have to erase this. <laughs> Actually, those are fine. All right, so we're going to label them breadth first, but we're going to traverse this tree depth first. So what is an Euler tor? An Euler tor is what you get when you start at the root, and you do a, and you do a depth first search with the tree. So you go down to B, then you go down to D. But the interesting thing is, when you come back up from visiting a subtree, you visit the parent again. So we're going to visit B again, then go down to E, then B, then A, C, F, C, G, C, H, C, and then back to A. So every internal node is going to appear twice. Every leaf node is going to appear once. And what do you get out of this? Well, let's write it out. A, B, D, B, E, B. And then A again. C, F, C, G, C, H. OK. And then uh, C and A again. OK, so I made an array out of my tree. Uh, I guess I could do RMQ on it. So what we're going to do here is now that we've got this Euler tour, we're going to take our two, two query nodes. Let's say they're, <coughs> we're trying to solve LCA of B and F. So we're going to find B and F in the Euler tour. Let's say we pick this one and this one. Well, we want to do LCA on that, but let's pretend we can't compare letters because they're letters, they're not numbers. So what should we do here? Turn our letters into numbers? Sure, how? <laughs> You're up there. Only the rule. That's a fair point. Distance? Yeah, so distance from the root. Let's try that. So A is 0, right? A is the root, so its distance from the root is 0. B is 1. D is 2. B is 1 again, right? So we're, we're computing this array of the level of the elements in the Euler tor, where, you know, so depth down the tree. So I'm just going to go ahead and fill this out. Okay, so now I've turned these into numbers so I can compare them, which means I can do RMQ on them. So, okay, well, the range minimum query of this range is 0, which corresponds to A. That's the root. If this was my actual query, well, that's the right answer. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Does that work for any selection of B and M? Yes. Why? Of the tour, I assume. Yes. Does anyone else want to explain in more detail? Or even in more detail, why the Euler tour does this? Uh, because the order, I, I can't like prove it, but I can say intuitively because uh, it's kind of like shrink wrapped, so you can't go any higher up in the in the in between the like the, the common ancestor will always be higher up in like the shrink wrapping of yeah. that shape. It'll always be between Shit. the two nodes because you're, you're going in order by depth. Right. So there's there's two parts to this group. So one part is the node the node that actually is the lowest common ancestor will always appear between any two appearances of your query nodes in the Euler tor. Note that you know B appears twice, but whichever one I pick, A is between B and F. And the reason for that is, well, you know. I'm going to visit B either once or twice. If I visit it twice, well, let's just consider the second time I visited it. Because the other, what's that? You visited it three times. Oh, sorry, three times, yes. Um, I'm going to visit it multiple times, right? <laughs> so let's just take the last time I see it, right? The last time I see it is when I'm leaving its subtree. And I'm going on back up to the parent and somewhere else. Right? So let's talk about. So B is the, the child that happens to be to the left. Um, so let's talk about the last time I see B, 
And let's talk about the first time I see f, because the stuff that's in between those needs to include their minimum query. And if you know the the next time I see f, um, it will also include um, the same nodes. So the, the last time I see b, and the first time I see f. Well, the last time I see b, I'm going up. So I'm going up to its parent. And the first time I see f, I'm coming down from its parent. So if they share an ancestor, because of the way the Euler tour is constructed, I have to visit all of their ancestors somewhere in between the last time I see b and the first time I see f. Is that cool with everyone? This means that you have to structure your query and then you go in the same, ask in the same order as the Euler tree is constructed. You have to start on the left side, per se, of the tree. So let's pretend that you know which order they are in and you can flip them if one's to the left and the other one's to the right. Um, you can do this by just, you know, in order and time, you do an in-order traversal of the nodes. You calculate their indexes, and then if one <coughs> index is higher than the other, you flip them. So yes, um, yeah, you can you can figure out which one's which. So uh, what's the other part of the proof? Right, um, you can't visit anything higher than their lowest common ancestor any time between any visit of those two nodes. Because if you did, then RMQ would give you that node and not the actual lowest common ancestor. So the reason for that is, well, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, if they share some ancestor, you can't go and visit any higher ancestors until you've visited that ancestor's entire subtree. So you have to touch both of your query nodes as many times as you're ever going to touch them before you ever see anything above that node. That was quick. Is everyone cool with that? All right, I'm seeing a lot of nodding. Okay, so um, what's next? Uh, well, that's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> for at least for reducing LCA to RMQ. Um, so that's called a reduction, when you take one problem and turn it into an instance of the other one. Um, the only tricky parts are, well, we've got to figure out how fast we can do this. Um, because if we're going to use RMQ to solve LCA, we better be able to turn an LCA problem into an RMQ problem and back fast enough. So, excuse me. So, is the transformation from LCA to RMQ that's the um, that's the preprocessing? Yes, that's the preprocessing. So then the query is: you're given two nodes. You find, you know, any two instances of those nodes. You may as well take the first time they appear, um, which you can calculate as you're doing the Euler term. You take any two instances of those nodes, you do an RMQ query, and then that gives you the node you wanted. Um, and that, so then A is the answer to the R, to the LCA problem. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. So let's say RMQ is this fast. This is you know, pre-processing and query time. How fast is LCA if we use this? And we just say f and g are some function we're going to assume is figured out by someone else. When you look up table, it builds a lookup table and you're pre processing how long you should are So you have, like, it's however long it takes you to generate your table for line q. Yep. And then you have your constant lookup time that gives you just r. Yeah, so, so how, how long is that, that pre-processing time? Well, you have to hit every node at least once, so mm -hmm. it's at least a little bit. Yep. Um, and then every node will be hit uh, n plus one times where n is the number of children for that node. So, so it would be number of nodes plus number of edges. Yeah, uh, those might be right. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm just a couple, I've had a couple beers, I don't want to think that hard. <laughs> so the trick with the Euler tour is going, you're going to traverse every edge exactly twice, and that makes this easy to figure out. So how many nodes are there? Well, there's n nodes. How many edges are there in a tree of n nodes? There's n minus 1, right? So you're going to hit every, every edge twice.
right? right? And then the the root appears like one extra time, um, so it's minus one, not minus two. Anyway, so it takes so the the Euler tor is basically of length two n minus one. It takes that that much time to get that, and it is it generates an array that long. So. Right? The preprocessing is create the array. Maybe this is, has some extra constants, but it's that. So it's create the array and then do R and Q preprocessing on it. And then to answer the query, as you rightly pointed out, it's all constant work to turn it into an R and Q problem and then to get the answer back out. So it's order one, constant time, plus whatever RMQ takes. Cool? And then this, of course, is just order n. But that's the time for the first query, or rather, the, the, you only have to do the, the setup of the array once, so yeah. if you do multiple queries, then the cost is only the cost of the query. That's, yeah. that's why so my notation here, doubled. yeah, so my notation here is this oh. kind of looks like a uh, dot product, sort of, yeah. product. Uh, the first element is preprocessing. The second element is each right. additional query. That's that's what we're going for. Uh, and there's also you could also put space in here, but for everything I'm going to say, space is the same as preprocessing. We'll just get that out of the way. Um, anyway, so that's that. Uh, all we have left to do is solve R and Q. <laughs> uh, okay. Someone shout out how we could do that. Uh, how could we preprocess an array? To answer R and Q. What's that? <laughs> and then we just all collapse. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, really, really stupid easy. Like brute force. So are people. Someone said brute force. That's the answer. <laughs> so how do you pre-process a problem? It has a finite input. Uh, check all pairs, yes. So we're going to pre-process this whole thing, every possible query, and build a big table. Um, while I'm erasing this, someone say how long that takes. Well, if you got all pairs, of n elements, that's going to be n squared elements. I don't think you can generate order n squared elements in order n time. But we'll get that. Um, but so, so the, the simplest way um, to generate all pairs of answers, how, how long does that take? So if we're just going to generate all possible pairs of indexes for the for the RMQ problem. And we want to just compute all the answers up front and store them in a table. How fast can you do that? Yep. N squared. Uh, it turns out if you ask a freshman to do this, they'll tell you and cubed if they know what they're talking about. <laughs> but once you learn dynamic programming, you can do it in N squared time. Right. right. So I've got a big array, right? Got this array. I'm going to generate a table from this array. It's going to have maybe the same number of things. If this is n, then this is n too, and so is this. All right. So what's our table in the store? Well, along the top, let's store the starting index of the query. So if our queries are, wow, that cleaning fluid really does something to you. <laughs> <laughs> if our queries are, really get right. are from, <laughs> <laughs> if our queries are from i to j inclusive, so if this is i and this is these are indexes, so i and j, and then our range is this, and our answer can be any of these elements. So along the top, we're going to put i. So this is you know, 
i is from zero to n. So, right? And down this side, we're going to put uh, j plus 1 minus i, basically the length of the array that we're looking at. So, um, I think it's plus 1 if you want to be strict about the stuff. Anyway, so L is going to be here. So this is the length of the array. Um, let's actually just call it J minus I because these are inclusive. So a zero here means that it's just from I to I. OK, so in this cell, we're going to put the answer to the RMQ that starts at zero and goes to zero. Well, let's that's, that's actually put some numbers in here. Uh, I had a smaller example, so I'm going to do that example over here. All right, so here's our example. Ignore most of this. We allocated too much memory. <laughs> so here, well, what's the smallest number between position 0 and position 0? 3. 3. Great. Except in here, we're going to put the index of the... Uh, um, of the answer, so zero. zero. Uh, just we'll get to why we want the index later, but it's not that big a deal. Uh, from one to well, the size of zero. So from one to one is going to be well. These are all just going to be the same indexes that they are, um, because any query starting at you know some position and going for not any farther is the answer at that position. It means to fill in the diagonal. Yeah, so we want to fill this in diagonally. So if you weren't using dynamic programming, it's the length. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 sorry. Yes, that was what your question was. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I thought that was right. Yeah. Sorry, this is the length <laughs> of the. This is the length of the. Sorry, that's why that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to shift everything down by n or by i, and it works. Um, so what are we going to do now? Well, if we're a freshman, we're going to go here and we're going to say, all right, what's the smallest thing between zero that or that starts at zero and goes one more? All right, well it's one. It's at position one. It happens to also be one. Now, what's the smallest thing that starts at one and goes one farther? Well, it's one. also one. Um, and we're going to continue doing this. And basically, every time we fill in one of these things, we're going to have to do order n work. Uh, and since there are n squared of these, that means we're doing order n cubed work. But we're smarter than that. We're going to use dynamic programming. So how do we actually calculate these? Well, we look at the things above. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen dynamic programming, we're looking at values we've already calculated and figuring out new data from that. Um, so we look at these, these two things up here, and we say, all right, the array that starts at 0 and goes one farther is going to have a minimum that's, well, it's the minimum of the array that starts at 0 and doesn't go anywhere else, and the minimum of the array that starts at 1 and doesn't go anywhere else. So I just look at the things that are, um, that are at these locations, and I write down the index of the smaller ones. That's, well, I already figured out that was 1, and the same thing applies here. So when I go here, I say, all right, the array that starts at 2 and goes no farther, that had the answer of 2, right? And the one that started at 3 was the answer. The answer was the, the element of 3, which is 0. And I see which one of those is smaller. I say, OK, it's 0, so I write that down. Uh, I write down its index. And the same thing for the last one. So that was super not clear because we were starting out with arrays that didn't go anywhere else. So now where it gets interesting is we have some overlap. So here we want the array that starts at 0 and goes too farther. But I already know the answers for the arrays for this array and for this array. So I can take the minimum of those two answers and then they're the same thing, so that's 1. And I'm going to continue filling this out. So now. Now my query is this. I want to answer, I want to fill in this box. But I already know these two. Well, 
this one's minimum element is one. This one's minimum element, element is zero. Zero is less than one, so I want this one, which is at position three. So I'll write down three. And that's kind of the first interesting data point of dynamic programming <laughs> uh, in this particular example. And I continue filling this out, and I actually end up with this. And now, now I've basically filled out every possible query I can throw at this array. And so now, to answer the query, it's pretty easy. I just go and look up the, uh, the element that I wanted. So I went real slow through that, because I don't know if everyone's seen dynamic programming. If you haven't, uh, please let me know if anything wasn't clear. Um, very useful technique. Anyway, right, so now I've, I've got this thing, so how fast is it? Well, I had to fill out, you know, n times n over two things, which is one half n squared, so that's order n squared. But then my queries are just, I subtract, <coughs> i from j, and then I look up some element in a, in a matrix, so that's constant time. So that's naive. Or I'm cute. <laughs> so we did it. It's uh, order n squared preprocessing and order one uh, query time. You all go home, right? <laughs> What's that? There will be some Well, that I wouldn't have written naive if there wasn't. <laughs> so, uh, what else can we do? What can we do that's that's less expensive than this? If you have structure, you're not not taking advantage of, but I'm not saying how to take advantage of it off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a problem about trees, right? <laughs> so we have logs. Let's try logs. Let's get rid of some of this. Also, let's get rid of this extra crap we allocated to the views. How can we use logs? Should she somehow be able to purchase frequency in linear time? Because the structure itself leads to the least common ancestor. The structure of what? Mm -hmm. Because you've got the root and then the two under it, their least common ancestor is above it. So you only have to process it once because if you're coming from the one above it, <laughs> Right, but you have n squared possible queries. Okay. Come back to me. <laughs> um, so what, what could we do that's less expensive than filling out every possible answer ever? Only filling out the answers you need when you need them. Right. Okay. So you could have sort of something like order one preprocess or zero preprocessing and then some amortized crap here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. It's not going to be like that, though. It's going to be totally constructive. We're going to do it right the first time, and then we're going to answer all our queries. All right. Go. When you wrote out the um, the translation, there were many ways that you could get the same answer, like right? the BNF appeared in multiple locations. Let's just so so right now. I'm just trying to solve our MQ. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm wondering if you could do something where, like, for each element, you keep track of the element to its left that is smaller than it, if any, and the element to the right that's smaller than it, or maybe larger, something along those lines. Am I, am I at least thinking of spot mark X, or? No. <laughs> <laughs> so. The way this is constructed, it's sort of uh, the overlaps are just of size one, but presumably you could be more clever with the way it's overlapping, but I don't know. How yeah, you could do that. Who's leading you guys on the right track? 
All right. Well, so one problem with this is we tried to write down every answer, right? Let's try to write down less than that because there are n squared questions and we can't do better than that. We have to write them all down. Uh, so we were trying to write down every, what was it? Every answer that starts at every possible index and is of any possible length. Well, I told you about logs, so let's just try only lengths that are powers of two. So what do we do here? I don't know why I keep throwing this. <laughs> All right. So instead of this y-axis here being the length of the query array, let's say this is the log of that length. Or equivalently, let's say this is the <coughs> ones that are, um, well, let's still have the zero one. Let's have ones that are of zero length, of one length, of two length, and then maybe of four. So we'll go all the way down here. Uh, or if you want to keep this as three, you can do some logs and some subtraction that works. So okay. So what's the smallest thing for? I'm getting tired of saying this, but um, arrays that start at zero and are of length uh, one. Well, that's, that's going to be a position one again. Actually, this one we already filled out. This is one, one, three, and three. Two, we actually already filled, filled that one out, too. This is not a super interesting example, but we'll get there. Now for length four. Um, the array that starts at zero and is of length four is this. Right. And we know the answer here, which is this one. And we know the answer here, which is this one. So let's just take the minimum of those two, right? Well, that's going to be a position three, right? And the same thing for this one. Um, but here, both of Sorry, you guys didn't check my map. <laughs> That's one. Um, sorry. So then the array that starts at one and is four long, it's going to be this array and this array. This one has an answer of index one. This one has an answer of index three. And index three is smaller, so we're gonna, again going to write down three. Cool. Uh, well. Now we're done, because if we go up to 8, we can't fit that query in our array, so we're done pre-processing. And if every time we go down a level, our pre-computing answer queries are getting twice as big, and they stop at the size of the problem, well, how many levels do we have here? Someone shout it out. Log in. Log in, yes. <laughs> Wait, I think, sorry, uh, I got very confused somewhere. So I was thinking about how you go about doing the pre-processing stuff, and it seemed like we didn't have enough space. So, so for the zero one, you have one, you're over one space. For the one, one you're, for the one of like one, you're over two things. For the length one of like two, you're over three things. For the one of like four, you're over five things. So sorry, these are, we're, I'm having trouble explaining this right because we're mixing up ex inclusive and exclusive. Um, so this this length here, this two, yeah. means um, basically, you know, if this is index zero, one, two, three, four, arrays of length two are where three minus one is two. But there's actually three elements there because the last one is inclusive. I'm just I'm having a bad time with notation. Right. So also in the four one, we have five elements, right? Yeah, that's the thing. I think you're right. And then the two one. You have oh yeah, you're right. Sorry, there's only one thing here. You're yeah. you're absolutely right. Uh, my mistake. Right. This one goes all the way out here. Um, this is just a bad example size. I'm not sure why I decided to do that. Okay. Sorry, that was very confusing. These numbers are confusing. The point is, every time. Um, 
every time you go down a level, the answer you're pre-computing, uh, the array gets twice as big. And so this has height log n. You still, this top one has n elements, or n minus 1. Um, question, or maybe not a quick question. Can you play the same stunt with the uh, where the offsets start, and only do you know you know two to the you know, you know queries of form two to the i uh, of links two to the i that start on an index two to the i. You might be able to do that, um, but we haven't finished with this one yet. Okay. So you gotta, we got to figure out how to answer queries with this, and then we can talk about that. Okay. So, how do you answer queries with this? You, you can't just do one lookup, you've got to do multiple lookups. I think you have to do words case plug in. I'm doing it correctly. Why? So, um, so which lookups should you do? Because, I mean, you need to, you would need to go you can't include stuff that's not, so, so let's say I have a length of seven, just to throw a number out there. I'd have to do the length of four, then the length of two, and then the length of one, and do the max of those three. So you can do log n queries with this, um, where you, you know, take all the, so let's say your query is. Oh, if I, oh, oh I'm still. So yeah, you divide up your array like. Actually, I take that back. If I have it, if I have it on every index. I can do it in two. Yes. So that's that's what we're getting to. So what you're imagining is a scenario like this, where you only do. Um, you only preprocess queries that begin at a power of two index, yeah. and that was what you're suggesting. Yeah. That requires you to do log n lookups. So. The answer for everyone who wasn't in either of our two minds <laughs> is um, that to perform the query, you've got the answer to all queries of sizes that are a power of two that start at this index. So if, you're, if your you know, actual query starts at this index, what you're going to do is pick the largest power of two that's smaller than your query. Uh, so just to make this interesting, let's say let's say I did this properly. What's that? You would have to go index one in order to make it interesting. Five. Yeah. Sorry, this is a terrible example. Let's pretend it's bigger. Let's pretend it's bigger. What's that? Is there a better example in the paper? <laughs> 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 So the let's say in 20 pages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's so fast because it's proof. Let's say we want to answer this <laughs> for this array. Well, we've got all powers of two that start here. Namely, we've got uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. We've got that one, which is the biggest power of two that fits in this array. I'm sorry that it's power of two plus one. My indexing is totally screwed. The other thing we want to look up is the one that is the same size, but pushed all the way to the other side here. So we're going to look up that, the, the minimum element in there. And we just take the min of those two. And it's okay that they overlap, because we want the minimum overall, and that's fine. So if we compute, if we pre-compute all arrays that are a power of two size, we'll always be able to find two of them that overlap a little bit and are their union is equal to our actual query, and maybe they overlap a little bit, but who cares? Um, and they don't go outside. And then the minimum of the answers to those two problems will be the actual answer we want. Our indexing was really messed up. Again, sorry about that. Um, is that. Does that start to become clear to everyone? Cool. Um, and so the same, basically the same dynamic programming trick of saying, well, you know, to compute this, we take this one and this one. To compute this, we take this one and this one. That same trick works. Um, and so it's really just the time to fill out this matrix. 
to process it. It's slightly different, right? Mm -hmm. Because the ones that are next to each other would quite get. Right. So you don't. So when you're when you're filling this one out, you don't use these two. Right. You use these two okay. to generate this. You have to get the offsets right, but that works. So, how big is this? N log n. N log n, yes. So this is the sparse table RMQ. And it is not O1 and amortized crap. It's something else. Preprocessing is order m log n. And queries are, well, it's order one. two lookups, so it's order one. Cool. So the original LCA was something like uh, order n plus two, sorry, it was order n plus this function of 2n minus 1. And then the query was order 1 plus that, so that's still order 1. This function of 2n minus 1 is still order n log n, which is bigger than order n. So we can solve the same LCA problem in n log n preprocessing in order 1 query time. Faster! <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's sparse table. Um, now, to move on, we need to notice something about the array that we're generating from LCA. We're, giving, we're gonna find that it has a certain restriction, and then we're gonna use that restriction to get a better algorithm. What's the time? Where is, let's see. 840. 840, cool. So I have two and a half tricks left to show you. And let's see if I can do it in 20 minutes. All right. So what is the special property of arrays that are generated from an Euler tor of a, or of a tree? What's interesting about that? You remember it was the level array, the, the depths of the nodes that we, that we care about for the RMQ problem. What's interesting about that array? There's obviously nothing interesting about that. Absolutely nothing <laughs> interesting. Let's charge forward. All right. So, what's that? Oh, but that's not a pro that's a property of the tree, not of the array. Um, so let's let's charge forward anyway. Uh, so here's a cool trick. We have an n log n algorithm. Right? Um, we've got this array of size n. Right? Cool. Let's chop it up. Specifically, we're going to chop it up into segments of size log n over 2. This is log n over 2, this is log n over 2, this, and so on. OK. How many of those are there? Log n over, uh, log n over 2 over n? Try again. <laughs> it's 2n over log n. So we've got those. Uh, all right. Let's put that into that. All right, so that's 2 n over log n. Sweet. Uh, all right, well, I know log 
logarithms. <laughs> All right, so if I'm taking the log of a division, I can subtract them. Put big order things around them because I forgot those. Well, these kill each other. And that's a minus sign, so I don't care about that. That's tiny anyway. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> All right, how do I do that? <laughs> well, if I break it up into these subarrays, I get this nice little expression that makes my running time go down to order up. So what can I do with these subarrays? Well, I can compute their, their minimums. So I can, from this array, I can compute one minimum. And I can also know where it is in the array. That's fine. I can do the same for this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. Cool. Now I have an array of that size. Which means, because of math, uh, I can solve that problem with order n preprocessor. Cool? Cool. Um, OK, so this is the, these are these subarrays. And so if I pick, so what does this actually give? Well, if I pick two of these subarrays, it means that I can find the minimum element in all of them with order and preprocessing and order of one query. All right, but my queries don't line up exactly with these. So how can I use that to solve the original RMQ problem? I'm sorry, can, can you explain how you got in of n sub of query? Math. Math. <laughs> um, basically, you say, all right, so I've got this array, this is going to be A prime. Sure. A prime is going to be the minima of each of these subarrays. Okay. And A prime has size 2n over log n, because I happen to choose that the subarrays were of size log n over 2. Okay. Good so far? Yeah. So now I say, all right, I'm going to preprocess A prime for RMQ queries. Okay, so you're going to build a tor. No, you're going to build the, the, the triangle um, A prime. Yeah, so I'm going to use the sparse table RMQ answer, and I'm going to say, I'm going to run this n log n preprocessing I see. algorithm on an array of size 2n over log n. I see. Okay, and then math, gotcha. And then <laughs> all the math. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Is it front? <laughs> it is. Um, no, it's not. Uh, so, okay. You, you could you you could just you know have it be all of the segments, all the complete segments in the middle, and then handle the fragments on either end. Bingo. Wait, hold on. I'm still back a step. So <laughs> so we then so so but now you have the, you have a sub problem that's not exactly the full problem. So how do you have O of one on the sub problem? We don't yet. You just, you said that at some point. So uh -oh. maybe I missed that step. Sorry, maybe not. Just um, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, maybe I imagine that. I just so yeah. so this the the RMQ data structure on A prime uh -huh. lets us answer queries where I and J fall exactly on these boundaries we've chosen. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So now the question is, if I can answer those questions with order n preprocessing and order one query. How do I solve general RMQ problems where these indexes might not lie on exactly on these boundaries? And the answer is, well, do this, do this crazy thing on everything in between your indexes, and then you've only got to solve it in two places. So let's say the, this is your actual query. You solve it with A prime on, the, on this middle part. And then you just have to solve it on these small little things. And those will almost always be fast. Is the is the handmade here? 
There's no hand waving. Okay. <laughs> so now the question is, all right, well, how do I how do I pre-process all of these little segments so that they can answer these little queries and do all the pre-processing for all of the segments in order n and so that they can all be fast, right? So if I can do this query in order one, this query in order one, this query in order one, then I can just min so them all. So you only need those subqueries where one of the boundaries is the edge of a subarray. Yeah. So what I really need to do is I need to pre-process each subarray from one subarrays that are of size log n over 2. Does it get weird when you get the series inside a subarray? Uh, then you just use what, however we're going to answer this to answer that query. You, 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 do the, you do exactly what you, you... You have the full table, the full sparse table for that subarray. So if it's just within a single subarray, sub you just answer it like it was mm -hmm. before. It's only when you're crossing boundaries and going into other subarrays that you need to. If you have the full sparse table for each subarray, then you're paying log n costs per subarray. We're not there yet. Let's get there, right? So, how, so if I just pre-processed every single one of these using the sparse table, that would still take too long. So I need to do I need to do something to make that take less time. Well. Maybe some of these subarrays are basically the same. So back to my earlier question. What's interesting about the RMQ uh, arrays that come from the LCA problem? They're not quite mirrors, but you're on the right track. Maybe you have repetition when you go to the node. What's that? It repeats itself a lot because they go through the same node multiple times. But more interesting, I thought you were talking about. I thought you were talking about a property of the Euler walk, and the property of the Euler walk is you <laughs> only have an increment of plus one between every index. Yes. Um, sorry, my words may not have been right. It's it's, uh, the, it's the property of the. <laughs> <laughs> it's the property of the array uh, that you get when you take an LCA problem and turn it into an RMQ problem by doing an Euler tour. Um, and that property is that neighboring elements differ only by plus or minus one. They don't differ by zero, they don't differ by two, just plus or minus one. That's because you're going up and down this tree as you're generating it. Which means that each one of these little subarrays is either, you know, each, every time I cross one of these lines, I go up or down one. So, What's next? Well, let's say this one is like 0, 1, 2, 1, 2. And let's say this one is 3, 4, 5, 4, 5. What's interesting about those? Okay, you know what position in a tree you are. What's that? You know what position, how deep in the tree you are. Yeah. But it's the same, the same, same pattern. Well, it's the same right? shape. So if you take this array, and you normalize it by just saying, well, you know, if I'm going to do an RMQ query on these two nodes, that's going to give me the same position within this array as an RMQ query on these two nodes, because they go up and down in the same pattern. So they're, they're structurally similar. And so really, you can normalize this and just subtract three all the way across, and you get the same array. So if you pre-process this array, then you come across this one and say, all right, I need to pre-process that. You say, oh, well, it's going to have the same structure as this, so I can just use the same already pre-processed structure here. So how many of these are there? Oh, sorry. Uh, how many distinct? <laughs> um, subarrays of, how many subarrays of this size um, the are there with different shapes? Two to the log n over two? Yes. That. Okay. What's that? Uh. 
Well, this is n. That's square root. So there's root n, possible different subarrays. Oh, sorry. So each of these, so each of these uh, positions is either going to be basically plus or minus one different from the previous one. So you can think of these as bits. So a zero means go down, and a one means come up. And so oh, you you represent yeah, yeah. an array like this as a as a bit vector, yeah, yeah. and you get this many possible vectors of length log n over two. You don't have to have. Was it? Those are your options. That's how many possible. How many possible ones? Yeah. So there's you don't necessarily have to have all of them, but there's basically root n possible ones. Okay. And so so just to derive the exponent, there is, if you encode each one as a bit, the exponent is because that's the size of each subarray. So mm -hmm. just the number of bits. Yeah. Okay. So that's nice, but that doesn't really get us anywhere. Uh, how do we pre-process root n of these things in order n time? Wait a minute, that's not too hard, right? <laughs> There's root n of any of these, and they're all of length log n over 2, we can do this with the naive one, right? Root n times preprocessing this one with the n squared algorithm. Well, log squared n is less than root n. So if we multiply them, that's certainly going to be less than root n times root n, which is n. So that's at much less than order of preprocessing. And we're done. <laughs> All right, so what are we actually doing here? Um, so we, sing figs. What's up? So there's a chemist somewhere freaking out about sing figs. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? But like a whole, it, it's a black hole of significant figures. <laughs> All right. So, so. Now that I've lost everyone, uh, <laughs> what did we actually do? Well, we realized that our array has this weird shape where each element only differs from the last one by plus or minus one. Then we did this cool trick where we took our whole array and we divided it into roughly n over log n subarrays. And then we solved a problem of size n over log n with a solution that takes n times log n time, but when you plug this into this, you get order n. And then we use the solution to the broken up problem together with solutions to all of these small problems that we were able to compute in significantly less than order n time. And now we're able to answer any query by saying, all right, well, I'm going to take the beginning little part of it here and use one of these subarray naive data structures I computed. And I'm going to do the same thing on the, on the end. And in the middle, I'm going to use this big fancy thing I constructed. And because I happen to be able to solve all these smaller problems in order n time total, and combine the results of all of the answers in constant time, I'm left with a data structure that is uh, sorry, this is not I'm left with a data structure that answers these plus or minus one Rangeman query problems in order n order one time which is just how long it takes to read the input. So that's cool. Uh, we can't go any farther, right? So we have to read all the, all the input, and that takes at least order n time, and we have to do something to give us an answer. So that's as good as we can get on RMQ. And our original LCA problem was, anyone remember it?
That was the, the LCA bound. Well, F here is order n, so that's still order n, so that's order n. Done. G here is constant. Done with that. So LCA is order n, order 1. More! <laughs> Let's go. Uh, now let's solve general RMQ. <laughs> Believe it or not, you do that experimental analysis of the cash effects? Nope. I, I don't know what you mean by you solve general RMQ. What did we just solve? So we solved plus or minus one RMQ. Oh. So we solved the constrained problem that we get from doing Euler Tor of the If we have a general problem, RMQ, there could be any gap between individual cells, basically. Right? We have this. That doesn't have that plus or minus one property, so we can't unify all those subarrays into the same naive data structure, so we're screwed. Uh, let's turn it into LCA. So. <laughs> How do we do this? Uh, we're going to construct a Cartesian tree. Um, a Cartesian tree is a heap, no, a, a Cartesian tree of an array is a heap of the elements in the array. So parents are smaller than their children, which makes sense. Um, and in order traversal is the original input. Uh, so it's a, it's a tree which allows it to be a heap, and it allows it to have an in-order traversal. And the in-order traversal is going to be the array. So how do we do this? Well, there's a Cartesian tree construction, which takes order n time. Um, I'm going to go through it really quickly. Basically, what you're going to do is for each element, you're going to go along, and you're going to make a new tree node. That's not very good. So we write down three. That's our root. Say, so, all right, 5 is bigger than 3, so it's got to go below 3. But it's also got to go to the right because of the own order property. Right child. Now we have 8. Well, it's got to go below 3, and it's got to go below 5, and it's got to be to the right of both of them. So there it is. Minus 1 is smaller than all of these, but it's got to be to the right of all of them. We have a new root. <laughs> And 6 is smaller than that, so 6 goes down here, and 27 goes down here. Cool. Uh, you can do this in order in time. Ask me how at the bar. Um, basically, you're going to keep track of the rightmost, sort of the rightmost element you just added. And if the new thing, so let's say we didn't have this part. So if you just got 3, 5, and 8, we just added 8. We want to add minus 1. Well, minus 1 is smaller than 8, so we can't put it there. We've got to put it above. So all right, is it smaller than 5? Yep. Is it smaller than three? Yep. All right, time to make a new root. If it were, let's say, six, then we would move this down, put six here, and do that. And now we've still got a heap property, and we've still got eight to the right of five and to the left of six. And that's kind of how you do that. Now, if I pick any two nodes, let's say three and six, they're in order, so they're, you know, at those points. We solve the LCA problem on that tree, and we get the answer of minus 1. Look, that's the smallest thing in that array. Uh, sorry that I had to go through that part so fast, but that's kind of where it all comes together. Um, you turn LCA into RMQ, and then you turn RMQ back into LCA, and everything solves itself. <laughs> so, someone here said it was fractal. You're right. Um, Anyway, that's that. Uh, kind of ran out of time, but I uh, hope you all had fun. Um, ask me questions later. I think there's some really cool stuff in here. Um, you know, reducing one problem to another is a really interesting technique. Uh, dynamic programming is a great technique. This trick of taking a lot, an n log n algorithm and solving a broken up problem of size n over log n, and then solving the smaller problems in a simpler way. Uh, that comes up a lot. Um, comes up in, I think, exponential trees. Definitely comes up in YFAST trees. 
Um, it's a really, really useful technique for sneaking like the last little bit of unfathomed algorithm. Um, anyway, that was fun for me. I hope I didn't get too lost.